I'm Bob Arum, and I'm with the Fighter's Voice. My name is Andre Ward. Now get out the competition. Fighter's Voice! <laughs> the Fighter's Voice. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Fighter's Voice. I'm your host, Richard Ortiz. We got a great show for you this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, I've been trying to book this guy from day one. I just fell in love with his personality, his energy, his hype. And I'm thinking, man, does this guy just go to sleep or does he just stay awake and drink Red Bull all day? And that's not a plug for Red Bull. And then I, I'm, I'm reading up on this guy. I mean, not only is he a stage actor, writer, director, uh, a motivator. I mean, you give him a concept, an, I, an idea. He doesn't just run with it, but he wins it. I mean, now he's taking over Las Vegas, you know, and I'll kind of nickname him the voice of Vegas. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, the one and only, this is boxing. This is the man with the left hook, the one and only Mr. Mark Chinook. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. You should be my agent. I think I am, man. I'm, I, yeah. I'm kind of, you know, I kind of feel your vibe. I got to give you 10% from now on. Yeah, you got it. I'm going to quote you on that. And it is recording, my man. All right. Thank you so much for having me on, dude. This is, this is, this is awesome. No, just having you on, man. And, uh, the first time that I saw you, I, I, I was thinking to myself, okay, top rank, they got a facelift. Where is this guy? Now, finally, some energy, and I'm thinking, man, I vibe off that because people don't like boring. People don't want to sit down. And in between fights, they want to be entertained. And you entertain them, not just from the middle of the ring, but you go out in the crowd. You make yourself presentable uh, as if to say, hey, I can touch a moving object with a microphone, and that's you, Mark. Talk to us about that gig and what it's uh, done for your life so far. Well, you know, before Top Rank, I was just, uh, you know, a boxing fan, really. And uh, I moved out to Las Vegas to, to open a Broadway show called Rock of Ages. Uh, I was performing nightly at the Venetian, and we'll talk about that. But uh, the Top Rank guys saw me at a Vegas Golden Knights game, which is also uh, another gig that I moonlight at. And uh, they said, hey, come and, come and see what we do with our fights and, and help us out and be a part of the Top Rank family. And, Man, did I land uh, with, with a great group of people. Uh, Top Rank is an incredible organization and uh, just blessed to be a part of the Top Rank family and, and help where I can. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the sport. Like I said, before I, before I took the gig with Top Rank, I was a fan of the sport. And uh, I'm learning just like, like anybody else who gets a new job. You sort of learn as you go. And uh, they, they've thrown me to the wolves and, and give me the freedom to create and help be a part of such, such a something special. You know, every fight that they produce, every card that they produce, it's, it's really a special night. And like I said, just grateful to be a part of the top rank family. Well, I know that you're used to the lights. I know you're, you're, you're used to it big time. I mean, I didn't even know you're, you're an actor in, in, in theater. What's it like? I mean, live. I mean, isn't it just a rush? But I want you to answer this. What's it like performing live in theater? And what got you into theater? Is that something that you wanted to get into growing up? You uh, said, carry into the sports. I'm going to do this acting gig. You know, it's just, it sort of fell in my lap. I'm, I'm originally from a small town in Canada. I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. And like any other Canadian kid, you, you want to strap on the skates and, and raise the Stanley Cup. So I grew up around the sport of <laughs> hockey, uh, played the game as long as I possibly could. And then I moved to New York City when I was 19 years old and really didn't know what I wanted to do. Finished college and, and just started studying theater in probably one of the greatest cities in our country. New York is a special place and I was there for almost a decade and I just got lucky. You know, I auditioned for some projects and, you know, work begets work in any profession. And it's the same in the entertainment industry. And I was fortunate enough to be able to perform on some of the, the greatest stages in the United States. and. Um, it's what brought me to Las Vegas. So, you know, I, it's like anything else. You get that nervous energy, that rush, uh, but it's all about preparation. So it's very much like sports. You know, these athletes can't walk into the ring or step onto the ice with preparing and, and training. And it's, it's no different when you watch a movie or, or a play in a theater. We go through the same thing. It's, uh, you know, months and years of dedication and hard work and 
for, for theater in general, it's a three to four week rehearsal process, uh, eight, eight hours a day, six days a week, we're rehearsing the show. And then there's a preview period where there's some invited audiences, we make some changes, and then it's open. And uh, the show's off and running. And like anything else, man, you prepare, you work hard, and you put it up there, and away you go. Yeah, I mean, just listening to what you're saying, it gets my blood going, man. It's just, you know, I can actually vision this. When you say theater, how much of an impact does the live crowd give you? I mean, you have your lines, you know what you're supposed to do, but is it that like, like, we'll, we'll Seattle Seahawks say like that 12th man? Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. And, you know, I, it's the same. It's the same at, at fights. You know, I feed off the crowd. The crowd feeds off of my energy. Uh, when I first started with Top Rank, I, you know, I was just the hype guy. You know, in between fights, like you said, I'd be running around the arena playing games with guys, giving prizes away, trying to make that that downtime in between fights uh, manageable. You know, because one thing I didn't know, because, uh, you know, prior to my time in Las Vegas, I just watch boxing on TV, just like everybody else on the pay-per-views. And I didn't realize how much downtime there was in between actual fights. And so that was that was an interesting learning curve for me when I was first invited out by Top Rank to just come out and observe what actually happened. Everything's programmed for TV, for pay-per-view. And so there is some downtime. And so it was kind of nice to just sort of have carte blanche to create content and uh, keep the fans engaged. You know, you're sitting there on your phone half the time anyway, so we want to make sure we can uh, get your attention and uh, just get you excited for the next bout. We do a pretty good job of it. I'm excited for this year. We've got some new new tricks to roll out, and we're always trying to come up with new ideas. Uh, so, you know, it, the crowd is 99% of it for me. You know, I, I love the energy. Uh, you know, I work with the National Hockey League as well. I do the Winter Classic and the Stadium Series. We go out to these big venues and 75,000 people screaming at you. Uh, it, it's a cool, cool experience. So uh, boxing fans, though, are no joke. They, they, know, they know their stuff. I almost wanted to say uh, something else. They know their stuff. Hey, you, and, can let, uh, you can let that tongue roll, man. Yeah, no, and it's been great. For me, you know, I, I don't try to pretend to be something that I'm not. You know, I'm not going to compete with, with these guys who have been working in the sport their entire lives. And, and to be surrounded by the ESPN crew, you know, Joe Tessitore, Andre Ward, uh, and, you know, Christina Poncher, I, the list goes on and on. These guys have dedicated their lives to the sport of boxing and to be able to be a fly on the wall uh, and, and just listen to them. Uh, you know, Bernardo Osuna, I've, I've grown to have such a respect for that man. It, just to be able to, to do what he does on the fly. Mark Kriegel doing these incredible uh, reports on, on these fighters. Uh, it's it's been fantastic and again coming from from hockey and theater the it's it's all over the place but to to really learn about these fighters and and their families and and see what they've been through to get into that ring it's just been like i said kid in a candy store uh to be a part of this sport in the way that i am you know it's just it's a blessing uh and i'm just so grateful every day that i wake up and get to go to work with top rank well you're you're living proof that you continue to grow and you continue to learn and you slam dunk these opportunities and you own them and you make them yours. A lot of people, when they get these opportunities, A, they're not ready for them or, or B, they may be afraid to take that jump. You dove right into the sharks, right into the ocean. And <laughs> not only are you swimming, you're like Aquaman. I mean, these animals are talking to you. These fighters, they respect you. And I remember when you started, I was going, I know he has a deep end. He's just going to let loose watch. because yeah, I it, it, you got to get comfortable with it, right? And First of all, the, the roster of talent that Top Rank has, not on the broadcast side, but but actually in the fighting side, you know, their roster of fighters is no joke with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Bud Crawford and, uh, you know, our new heavyweight Anderson. We got Lopez, who just shocked the world, became a champ, and Shakur Stevenson coming up. Uh, you know, to be able to learn about these guys and, and meet these guys and you sort of become a part of their their world because I'm a part of top rank. So they, you know, they, they're always, Hey Mark, what's up? Big hug. And you know, you're following their, their social media life. You see their training camps and, you know, to be able to watch these guys do what they do day in, day out and dedicate themselves to the sport and then to meet their families. And it, it's, it's unreal. And it's, it's something that I've never experienced before. And now two years in with, with this top rank family, it's just been, it's been great. No, uh, you know, exactly. I've done some top rank events and just covering with media, and uh, they are definitely 100% professional, friendly, and um, they make sure it, it, the job gets done. 
<laughs> There's no ifs or buts to it, man. And, uh, you know, I would have to say you're surrounded not, not just among these great athletes, but we're talking about walking, talking Hall of Famers. I mean, with, with the, you got your Lee Samuels and, and the Brad Goodmans of the world and uh, the Bob Arums. How does that make you feel when you know that you have their blessing and most of all you have their respect? Yeah, you know, it's like I said, kid in a candy store. You know, you're surrounded by legends every day. Uh, and like I said, I'm learning. You know, I have so much more to learn about the sport, about behind the scenes. You know, I just I know what I bring to the table. And, you know, I try to just make sure that I focus on that for right now and I keep growing within the sport. And, you know, I watch as much of it as I can from all the other promoters and, and see what they're doing. And But, you know, again, I. I Brad Jacobs is the, who I report to every day and to have him as a boss is, uh, is pretty incredible. And, you know, when Bob Arum's down the hall in his office, you're kind of like, wait a minute, is this, is this even real life? You know, and it, it's so far beyond just the sport of boxing. You know, they're, they're just incredible human beings and to be able to call them friends is, is, you know, priority one coworkers second, you know, we, with everything that's going on in today's world, uh, you know, family first, you know, work second, but it's, it's a pretty small line between family and work when it comes to top rank boxing. And, and I mean that sincerely, they're, they're just incredible people. And, uh, you know, what they, what they were able to accomplish with the bubble recently, uh, all last year at MGM is second to none. They really set the bar high, not just for boxing, but for every sport, you know, everybody looked at what top rank was doing at MGM and how they, they contained uh, the bubble or kept everybody safe with the testing and the protocols and, and how they treat their fighters. And again, it's just, uh, I could sit here for an hour and just talk about how lucky I am. So, you know, it, they're just great, great people. And I'm, I'm just so grateful to be in their camp. Now you're, you're truly blessed. Uh, real, real quick, ignore that man behind the curtain. KP, I can see you on screen. So maybe uh, the viewers can't, but it, it's all good. So ignore that man behind the curtain, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, little take from the Wizard of Oz. Hey, but I want to ask you this, man. And um, what is, um, I was looking at this, what is Monday's Dark? What, what's that all about? Talk yeah, to me. Yeah, so um, eight years ago, I, I came out to Vegas, like I said, to open uh, the show Rock of Ages. Right. You know, again, blessed to just sing 80s tunes in a Broadway show, screaming every night. Uh, my wife and I decided not long after that, that we knew we were going to be in Vegas for a little while. The community here really embraced the show. And so Monday's Dark uh, came from the fact that we wanted to give back to the local community. The name comes from the fact that the traditional Broadway schedule, uh, we're dark on Monday, we don't perform. So we perform Tuesday through Sunday and Monday is our only day off of the week. And so that's where the name came from. And, and what we did basically is we created this really goofy variety show where we'd get all the entertainers in town from the strip, some from LA, whoever happened to be in town on that given Monday night, I'd get a band together. We'd put a band up on stage and uh, you know, we, we charge 20 bucks to come to this party essentially. And all of the money would go to a local charity. And so over the course of these last seven years, it's been around seven years now, every other Monday. So two Mondays a month, we throw this Monday's dark party and it's a different local charity every other Monday. And every other Monday, we write a check for $10,000 to that local charity. So I've thrown about 120 parties now, 125 parties. We've raised $1.2 million wow, uh, for Las Vegas, charging 20 bucks. You know, and it was just something that we felt uh, we needed to do because, again, uh, now I work in sports. And you can ask anybody who works in sports. It's not a job. It's, it's, a, it's just an honor. And the same thing in the entertainment business. If you can call yourself a working actor or if you work in the entertainment business, you're, you're pretty fortunate. It's a, it's a lucky place to be able to call work. And so we wanted to give back and that's really where it stemmed from. And it's, it's just our passion project. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, everybody volunteers their time from the band to the crew, myself, my wife, everybody involved. And uh, it's all just about giving back to the community. So that's what Monday's Dark is in a nutshell. We're pretty proud of it. It's just this goofy little underground party. So if you ever in Vegas on, on a random Monday night, look us up. We'll be, we'll be thrown down at this place called The Space, which is a, a venue that we started here in Vegas. It's a warehouse that we, we converted. It's a community center. And 
We're just trying to make sure that we can help the community as best we can. So that that's Monday's dark in a nutshell. And I thank you for asking about it because it's uh, you know it's a side of it's a part of our life that we don't we don't talk about too much at the forefront, but it is uh, it's a big part of our lives because we know we're helping so many people with it. You know what, man? I mean, I have a up the utmost respect for you going into this interview, and now it's just it just went through the roof. It's a slam. <laughs> that 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 is a strong uh, man. That's like a missionary that that's just strong. That's like ministry. I mean, that's yeah. awesome. You're, you're yeah. I don't, I don't go to church. So I guess this is the closest thing that, that I have to go into church. And uh, you know, it's something we, it, it's a well-oiled machine now, you know, we get 400 before COVID we had like 350, 400 people showing up every Monday night, packing this warehouse band, singers, dancers, magicians, comedians, you never know who's going to show up. All the money goes to charity and, the minute that Monday night comes down, the following Tuesday, we're already working towards the next one. And it's every two weeks and uh, Vegas has embraced it, you know, which is great. The entertainment community here in Las Vegas, uh, all the entertainers on the strip, headliners, you know, crew, musicians, you name it. They all know about it. They all want to participate when they get the ask. And that's another big thing. You know, it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the support of the entertainment community willing to to come out and donate their talent on that given Monday. So uh, mondaysdark.com shameless plug you can go to mondaysdark.com and you can see all the charities that we've partnered with all the shows that are coming up uh, but it's you know again it's it's the side hustle but it's the hustle for 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 something bigger than any of us you know we're just helping these charities out because uh, during covid you know all of their events have been canceled you know they're you know fun runs and banquets and galas all the things that you hear about these charities do and they're all canceled so their their fundraising efforts are, are challenging so we've been doing this stuff uh, just like this we're streaming concerts and doing it with limited uh capacity following all the cdc guidelines but every two weeks we write a check for 10 grand uh to a local charity right on man you know what for a lot you're heaven sent my man you really and I appreciate that. Thank you. Before I move on, I really don't want to move on from it. There's, <laughs> there's going to be a big concert or, or a big fight on, on Saturday uh, with a hidden talent. These guys are going to have a hidden talent. And they're going to cancel their flight for Sunday. They're going to say, hey, we'll fly out Tuesday because we're staying Monday and we're going to get back <laughs> that Monday. I mean, uh, that'd be great. You're going to see the Bud Crawfords, the Tyson Furies, and the. it doesn't matter. They can just be there and people will pay because they just want to see them up front, maybe hands on with them. So you mark my word, that's going to happen, my man. Let's do it. Let's do it. We've already outgrown the venue, you know, but we like the fact that we turn people away. You know, it's become this sort of underground Monday night party and uh, sells out every two weeks. So I like that. We can probably go to a bigger venue, but I like selling out and saying, hey, come back in two weeks or just buy your ticket early, something like that, you know. No, there there you go. And what I really want to ask you, man, is you're, you're in front of the light. We talked about that. How do you prepare yourself for theater as opposed, okay, now I'm going to prepare myself because I want to pick your brain a little bit for I'm re-announcing t- t- today. How do you prepare yourself? And, and when you wake up that morning, how do you make that transition? When do you make that transition? You know, it, for me, I, it, it, they're pretty much one and the same. I, I, it's, it's like anything else. You got you to gotta put the work in. You got to, you know, do the homework and know what the heck you're talking about. Um, if I say something and it, it doesn't sound honest or it's not authentic, you're going to know, you know, so uh, I have a great partner in crime at top rank, Evan Korn, who handles all of the PR. He handles all of the, the Evan. Yeah. and so, you know, he's, he's been very great uh, with me and, and sort of guiding me and coaching me and, and being there again, same with Brad and everybody else. But at the end of the day, you got to do your homework. You got to know how to pronounce these guys' names. Uh, you know, I, I I'm fortunate that in the bubble, I, I do the press conference, uh, the weigh-ins, and the you know I've been lately doing the ring announcing. So by the time the fights come around, if I don't have these guys' names down, you know I shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and then you know from I, I looked back at the footage from the first time I did this in the bubble to the last weekend in the bubble, and you know it's just my confidence and just sort of the the understanding of of what I was walking into has changed so much. You know I've only been it was my first stab at, at doing ring announcing. I've hosted many sporting events and have done a ton of interviews, but you know, it's not every day somebody calls you and says, Hey man, while we're in the bubble, you're going to be doing our ring announcing. I was like, Oh, like, okay. What does this mean? You know, and luckily, uh, you know, I've been able to sit beside Lupe Contreras for the first year and a half that I was with top rank and talk about somebody who's the best and one of the best, yes. if not the best in the business, who just makes it look so easy. 
And, uh, you know, I, I count my blessings because I, I'm here because of the bubble and I, I live in Las Vegas and, you know, it was an incredible opportunity for me. Uh, so, you know, again, just uh, learning as I go. But when it comes to the preparation, it's just literally getting the material, ripping it apart, making sure you're comfortable, um, you know, finding your rhythm for me. You know, I, I like to sing. So for me, I, I like to try to find the musicality in everything that I say. And, um, yeah, it's just again, just putting in the work and, and making sure you don't sound like an idiot half the time is, is pretty much what I keep reminding myself. I'm like, just take a deep breath, don't rush. And, you know, I sometimes think about how I would want to be introduced. You know, if it was me standing there, you know, how I would want, you know, certain emphasis on certain things done. And, you know, I'm finding my groove. Um, long way to go yet, but, uh, you know, learning on the job just like others and uh, just, you know, having a blast doing it. Well, well, you know what? You're doing a great job. And a shout out to Loopy. Loopy, my man, we got to have you back on the show. Thanks for sending me that, that shout out. I appreciate that. When you talk to Loopy, I mean, his voice is just, he's just ampli uh, amplified. You know what he, I mean? Like he has an amplifier. He's, he's gold. He's golden, man. He is golden. Both English and Spanish. I mean, I mean, he hits it, man. So yep. You took some advice from someone that's definitely, uh, if not one of the best in the top five of all time. Oh, a hundred percent. And, you know, you can go back in history too and, and watch some of the old guys who used to do this and, you know, even in other sports, I know it sounds, you know, campy, but like even these wrestling announcers and uh, auctioneers, you know, they have such a, a tone and musicality to the way they say things. And uh, again, like I said, I'm just trying to find my voice within the sport of boxing and, and, and try to create something that's unique for myself. You know, I'm not trying to be anybody else out there because, you know, I can't. Uh, you know, I'd be acting at that point. I'd be trying to be a buffer or, or Lupe or, you know, but it's just been, uh, it's been, a, it's been a, a real trip, a real joy. And, uh, you know, who knows what's next? You know, uh, if this bubble disappears, I'm sure things are going to go back to the way they were prior to the bubble. But in the meantime, I'm just trying to take it all in and enjoy it every step of the way. Hey, man, you do what you love. You never work a day in your life. And it, it sounds, right. you're not working anymore. You're, you're actually retired. <laughs> yeah, know, it, it, it's here. actually been nice to have uh, a little bit of downtime this December to spend time with my wife during the holidays and uh, top rank uh, we go back to work in February we've got some huge fights coming up in February so you know January I'm spending most of my time here in, in Vegas getting the Monday's dark stuff squared away we've got some other projects that we're working on but you know like I said I'm excited to get into the ring again and, and, and get back to work with top rank there's there could be some pretty, pretty massive fights uh, down the line here in 2021. Well, you know, you could drop dime on it later on. You can email me and say, Rich, these are coming up, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you'll know before I do. You'll get a press release from Evan before I get the call. I'll be like, hey, Ed, we got, uh, you got a ring sheet for me tomorrow? He's like, oh, yeah, I'll get it to you tomorrow morning. I'm like, all right. There, there you go. There you go. Actually, speaking of Evan, I'm going to uh, address some of these questions. This question is coming in from Evan from Top Rank. Uh-oh. Here it goes. It says, Mark, how does the pressure of announcing in front of a live TV audience compare to being a theater actor? That's a good question. Evan sent that one in, huh? Yeah. Uh, I try not to think Evan's about been drinking, it. Evan's drinking all night. so just <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> He's texting me for my Netflix password. That's what's that's, that's happening. There you, now. There you, go. Uh, you know, I try not to think about it. Uh, just like when you're on stage in front of a couple thousand people in the theater, you know, you're, you're not you're not really paying much attention to them. Obviously, they're there. Um, I try not to think about it because the numbers are, are a lot higher than what I'm accustomed to, especially when you got uh, Loma Lopez and there's two million people tuning in. You know, you try not to think about it. You just, you know, you just say hello to that lens, smile and nod and keep it moving. Uh, it just goes back to what I was saying before. It's It's preparation. Just making sure that you understand, uh, you know, what what the message is that you're trying to convey, and make sure you have all your facts. You know, at the end of the day, these guys have records, they have hometowns, there's weights, there's corners. Yeah, I just try to make sure that I get them all right. Well, I'm going to change it up a little bit. This next question is coming from Frank Astea with Top Rank. It says, ask him if he has any stories about the haunting of a cardiac suite. Oh, wow. You know, that's a touchy subject, Frank. Um, you know, we're spoiled uh, at top rank in the bubble. So at MGM, we have a private floor 
Uh, the 12th floor of MGM Grand is dedicated to the ESPN crew, top rank staff, and uh, all the fighters and their camps. I don't have, he's, he's bringing up a, we had, we had almost a, a scary moment where we lost somebody tragically on the floor. And so that suite is now, we, we think it's haunted. Uh, <laughs> you see some fighters walk the other direction. Frank won't go near it. I think Frank actually had to spend a few nights in it. He wasn't too happy about it. Uh, I try to make sure when I check in, I'm not on that wing of the floor. Uh, so if I see that the number is, is close to that room, I go back to the front desk real quick and I change it and I make sure I'm in the other wing. Because, you know, that the way the MGM Grand is built, it's got one tunnel this way, a hallway that way, another hallway. I, I stay clear of that hallway. I try not to go near that room. So no, no, no crazy stories. But uh, some of the fighters walk in different directions when they pass by the door. I'm, I'm sure they do. <laughs> it's from a promoter, Rick Morrigan, and manager of Jose Ramirez. And uh, also signed some other fighters like the, the likes of, of, of Virgil Ortiz and uh, the, the professor, uh, Frosto. Yeah. He says, tell Mark that I said hi and that he's one of my favorite personalities in the sport. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. Hello, Rick. Uh, one of the hardest working promoters, I would imagine, in boxing. And, you know, I've only been around the sport, you know, professionally now and working in it a couple of years. And just a genuine guy who goes out of, the, out of his way to say hello. Uh, can't walk by you without shaking your hand and saying, hey. And I think that just right there speaks volumes of who he is. He's really well respected in the top rank world. I know that everybody, when I'm passing down the hall and I hear his name come up, it's always in, in great standing. And, you know, he just, he works so hard for his fighters. He does. So if there are fighters listening and you happen to be represented by that guy, uh, you know, he's one of the best in the business. So uh, just great, great guy. And uh, what's up? Thanks for saying, hey, man. I agree with you. He's definitely somebody you want in, in, in your corner or just to associate with. And uh, iron sharpens iron, man. You, you want to be right there with him. And he, and he puts on great fights. Like, you know, there's nothing dull about, about any of his events, man. Like, he, he just packs it, packs it in there. You know, he puts his, his money where his mouth is. And when I roll up to work and I look around, I'm like, where the heck did all these people come from? And then I'm looking down at the sheet. I'm like, oh, it's one of Rick's fights. Yeah, it speaks for itself. He, he packs them in. He knows what he's doing. And I know he's got a lot of tricks up his sleeve. I, I follow him on social, and he's always thinking outside the box on, on where where to put a fight. You know, where can we host this? Let's do it in this stadium. Let's open up the baseball field. And I'm like, holy jumping! The guy works really hard, and I love going to his events. Yeah, I like I like his humor too. It, it's kind of off the wall sometimes, but uh, you got to look at it twice. You know, like almost like that movie. You got to watch it twice to catch that one scene. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, man. So. Any chance of you ever just doing a uh, – this, this is one of the questions coming in too, doing an exhibition match, getting in the ring and going on uh, hands-on to, to, to feel exactly what the fighters feel. Training. I, I, I think so. I, I think there's an opportunity for that. I, you know, I, I, I've definitely worked out in the boxing gym here and there. Um, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a gym here. Let's, let's do it on a Monday dark, right? <laughs> That's right. We'll do it out in the parking lot. Uh, Fight Capital here in Las Vegas. There you go. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've put on the gloves at Fight Capital a little bit. You know, I, I, I got my COVID hair going right now. I haven't shaved. I feel like I'm 20 pounds overweight. I probably should get back in there sooner rather than later. Yeah, I think that would be fun. Put the headgear on and go and do a couple rounds. I think it'd be a blast. Yeah, I, I can see you doing it. I mean, you have that personality. You, you know what? You're kind of compact. You'd be inside fire. <laughs> I, I might need a, I might need a or, or Robert yeah. Garcia's one of the two. <laughs> I might need a step stool or a ladder, uh, <laughs> depending on who I face. But I definitely would get in there. <laughs> no, hey, I, I can see you in there. I had a conversation with uh, Lee Samuels last week, and um, your name came up, and he had nothing but good things to say about you. You told me how um, you were welcome to the top rank family uh, about, you know, the story that you shared with the hockey and uh, that you were approached. And they said, man, we just love his personality, the energy. But uh, I mean, that's coming from a Hall of Famer, man. I mean, that's when you hear that. How does that make you feel knowing, hey, I've only been doing this with top rank for only this amount of months or, or, or time. And to know that the ball's already spinning in your direction towards one day, possibly the Hall of Fame. <laughs> who knows man uh to have lee in your camp uh you know we could we can go on and on about everybody that's in that top rank family but 
you know, he's one of a kind. He's a Hall of Fame member. And uh, I remember we were in upstate New York not too long ago at, uh, I forget the hotel and casino name up there that, that hosts our fights. But, you know, we we're in Verona and the Hall of Fame's just around the corner. And we visited. I bought some merch. And, you know, he was there. And uh, again, it's not every day that uh, you get to call these guys friends, you know, and, and have them support you and, and believe in what you're trying to accomplish. And, and then just to, to just to welcome you with open arms and be like, hey, man, we, we appreciate what you bring to the table. And, and thanks for being a part of it. That, that it's just it's humbling. It's, it's 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 so nice to hear. And he's such a he's such a great guy. So, uh, you know, tip of the cap to Lee, he's, you know, Hall of Fame. That's all you got to say right there. Absolutely. Hey, we're going to switch it back real quick because um, I wanted to ask you more about your 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 acting career. I mean, uh, talk to us about this role, this award for, you know, Disney's The Lion King. Talk to us about that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I was I was blessed to play Timon in The Lion King. Everybody knows the movie, Hakuna Matata. Yep. So I went on the road and I toured with the big production uh, for about three years, two and a half years. And uh, at that time, you know, I, man, it was almost 15, 20, 15 years ago now. It's just time flies. And um we spent three months at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and that was the first time that I was ever introduced to the Kennedy Center. And, you know, beautiful theater. It's iconic, you know, one of the you know, best in the United States. And they have a, a, an award program called the Helen Hayes Awards. And I was nominated for a, a supporting role with my, my, my role there as Timon and the Lion King. And that it's kind of the first big role for me in the theater world, booking the Lion King. And and going up on the going on the road with that, I didn't win, uh, but it was it was nice to be nominated. No oh, bullshit, I wanted to win, uh, but it, you know it was it was it was a great experience, and uh, you know it was an it's an iconic show. You know everybody knows the Lion King, whether you saw the, the Broadway musical or you saw the cartoon, Never everybody did. knows it. And to be able to play the Hakuna, the kid who sings Hakuna Matata, you know it doesn't get any better than that. I have uh, four older siblings. I'm the youngest of five, so I'm. Uh, I'm the cool uncle in the family. And that was definitely probably one of the highlights, you know, you, you, same here, you know, it's, you talk about the jobs that we do for a living. They're not really jobs, but when you can share them and share those experiences with your family and your brothers and sisters and their kids and, you know, the same thing with top rank now, you know, I'm, I, my family's still all, all up in Canada. I've been in the United States now over 20 years. I'm a citizen, but my entire family's still up North and, you know, they get to see me on TV doing goofy stuff. And, you know, I'm still that cool uncle who lives in Vegas. And whether I'm doing a Broadway show or a, a fight with top rank, it, it's it's one of the one of the things that I, I, you know, I love the most is that I know that my family's watching and uh, they're proud. You know, we all love our families. We all love our mom and dads. And, you know, that's, that's something that I don't forget when I go to work, whether it's a, a Broadway show or a a fight with top rank or a, a, an NHL hockey game, you know, I carry my family pretty close to the chest and, you know, so it's something I'm proud of. You know, I, I've been to Canada in the winter <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you this, I'll best describe it this, correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you're going to laugh, okay? I didn't know about the boots that you, I needed boots. I, I, I had dress shoes on yeah, and no. it was so cold that the bottoms of both shoes, they cracked, both of them, they split. It's because you have nice shoes. You got leather sold shoes. You got nice shoes. And I didn't even know I can hit like black ice just when I'm walking on the snow. Oh, yeah. Balancing myself. And it was so cold. When I went outside, I can best describe it. It's almost like a slap in the face from the wind. It just, it hits you. And when I brought my phone out to get some like content, I literally, honestly, had to go to the restroom and put water on my hands. That's how cold it was. <laughs> I had to put my glove on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's no joke. Yeah, I grew up in a town uh, five hours north of Detroit, Michigan. So Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario is uh, right on Lake Superior, five hours north of Detroit. And uh, in January, when you walk outside, there's not necessarily wind, but it's so cold that your nostrils immediately freeze. Yeah. And it's it's one of those things you see on TV. If you were to take water and throw it in the air, it evaporates. It's so cold. So, yeah, I get you, man. Uh, I miss home. I don't miss home January through March. <laughs> no, I know exactly what you're talking about. But I will share with you, I got to see my first hockey game ever. 
and it was the San Jose Sharks against the, um, gosh dang it, oh gosh, uh, the the Blue Guys. St. Louis Blues? No, 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 man. Maple, Toronto Maple Leafs. Sorry, Maple Leafs. Yeah, Toronto Maple Leafs. Yes, yes. So when I'm walking there, there's usually people selling tickets. There's yeah. people wanting to buy tickets. Hey, you want to sell your tickets? Hey, you want to sell your tickets? So I go there on my first my first game ever. I mean, the atmosphere, the energy. I mean, I have a whole new respect for these hockey players. These guys are like 6'5", 6'6", and freaking athletes on the blades. Yeah. They're like running backs. On the drop of a dime, they can cut, maneuver, and just, yes. So yeah, long, it's story a sport. Short, long story short, when I go there my first game, I get to see my first fight, <laughs> and I get to see my first overtime. There you go. So after it went overtime, and nobody scored, so I got to see my first shootout all in my first game. That's perfect. It, it, and you saw, it, you saw it in Toronto. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's the hottest, one of the hottest tickets in hockey. You know, the, the market in Toronto is uh, insane. You know, the Toronto Maple Leafs are, a, a, you know, original six hockey team in the league. And uh, seeing the National Hockey League game with the Toronto Maple Leafs in Toronto, yes. there's nothing better. No, and you see all the banners of all the all the guys before them back in the day, and it's just you knew you were looking at, at some art. You knew you were looking at something that just means something. And I'm looking to the left and to the right of all the fans, and they're like boxing fans. They're like football fans. This is their life. They oh, yeah, they're in it. Like they're on the ice. Yeah, when you're – you know, I've been fortunate to, you know, obviously work for the Vegas Golden Knights and, and now with Top Rank. When you're a fan of a sport – it's uh, it's a lifestyle, and you know it's 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 incredible to be a part of it. It's one of the things that I love the most about my time with Top Rank is I you know I get to go up in the stands and say hello to people, and you know they've <laughs> had a few beers, they're having a good time, <laughs> waiting for the fight to start, but so knowledgeable and uh, passionate about who's about to enter the ring or take the ice, and it just gets loud. I like it when it's loud. You know that energy is amazing. That's 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 it's what I love about my job. I love giving people the permission to scream and get on their feet and and bring it. And uh, it, it's it's a pretty cool thing to be a part of for sure. I bet, man. Just just the rush it, itself, man. And uh, I've had my share a little taste of it, but it's 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 um, the, the the best high in the world. Yeah, it is sports yeah. live and and really, you know, I'm not a basketball guy. I think it you know doesn't really get going until the end of the third quarter, uh, but that doesn't exist in hockey. That doesn't exist in boxing. Uh, the minute you're in the ring, it's on, and you better be ready to go. Otherwise, you're on the canvas. Same thing with hockey. It's so fast that the minute you step on the ice, you better be ready to go, or you're going to get knocked down, and, and the puck's going to be in the net. So, yeah, two of the two of the greatest sports to be a part of, and uh, it's it's just been a trip. Let me ask you this, man: Have you okay? Have you ever been on TV and you had an itch on your face? What do you do? You don't itch it. <laughs> uh, oh, you know, you got a sneeze coming on. Yes. You got a cough. Yes. You know, you're a little tickle in your throat. You just, you find ways. And uh, it's, it's been exciting to watch the guys from ESPN too because they have all their little, you know, their uh, superstitions and their routines and to see, uh, you know, what Andre Ward does or can, can, Bradley Jr., what they do. Can you share any of them? You don't even have to give their name. Can you share any of them? Uh, there's a lot of um, Listerine, you know, those little Listerine strips. Yeah, I see a lot of that circulating. Pre-COVID, everybody was sharing. Now everybody has their own stash. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's definitely some specific beverages uh, not alcoholic, but everybody has their own thing, whether it's a tea or a sparkling water, uh, Gatorade, uh, nothing really sugary going on back there, but they're all, they're all pretty healthy guys, and, uh, to, to, especially to watch the, the, the fighters now get into broadcasting. Right? Not so much Joe Tessitore. That guy's a professional. Same with Bernardo. Um, you know, they, that's what they do. They've been doing this. They got their routines down pat, but to see the fighters – you know, to see Timothy Bradley <laughs> rehearsing a, a, a hit, you know, it, it's, it's, it's so much fun to watch because they'll, they'll rehearse what they want to talk about before they go live on air. And to watch Timothy Bradley just go through his motions and he'll start talking, hey, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm good, I'm good. I don't need to rehearse anymore. I'm good, I'm good. I got it, I got it. <laughs> it's just, it's so great to be able to witness that stuff. And uh, they're just great guys. And to, one of the nice things about my gig now is I have, a, I have an earpiece in, so I get to hear them call the fight 
the entire fight. So while I'm watching it, I'm actually hearing Tess, Bradley, Bernardo, Mark, Andre, they're all, uh, Christina, and they're all calling the fights. So I'm watching the fight and I think I'm seeing one thing and I'll hear Christina Poncher talk about something else. And I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even know that. I didn't even notice that. And so I'm leaning in a certain direction. You know, same thing with, with Andre and, and Timothy, the way they break it down and, and call these fights. That's one of the, the biggest things that I've, I've learned from is being able to have them in my ear, uh, calling the fight while I'm watching it in real time. It, it changes the, the, the dynamic for me as I'm sitting ringside. So I'm, I'm looking for specific things now. And, uh, you know, I can, I can watch the guys pretty closely in the corner in between rounds, pick up on certain things. And then, you know, sure enough, you know, 95% of the time, these guys are right on the money and they know exactly what's going to happen the next round. And there he is, guys, and KO'd. And if he doesn't change that, he's going to get hit again. And sure enough, he gets hit again. You know, so it's, it's been awesome to have that uh, sort of fly on the wall experience. Exactly. And here's one. I mean, there's a fight going on. You know it may end soon, but you're like, okay, I could probably hold it one more round. Yeah. Have you ever had to go to the restroom? I mean, too much coffee or something. And But you know if you're back there and that fight ends, you got to call that fight. you got to get back in that ring. Have you ever had that happen to you? Yeah, there's been, there's been a few times where I'm like, oh, this one ended pretty quick. Uh, you know, especially in the bubble because it's, it's a different experience where, you know, I'm on a platform away from the ring for the introductions. And then when I call the fight, when I go to the, the decision or whatnot, I'm on the floor beside the ring. I don't even get in the ring. So I go over to the commission's table. I get the results, walk back over to the timekeeper's table, and I'm waiting for the cue from you know ESPN from broadcast after the guys do the breakdown of the fight before we go to the cards or I read the decision. I'll wait for the for the cue from ESPN. But there have been, been times where the fight's over in 20 seconds. And I'll, you know if it's a Berlanga fight, don't go anywhere. You know, the guy's knocked everybody out in the first round. I think the longest he's fought is just over two minutes. So anytime that, I learned that one the wrong way, I was like, a minute, this guy's in the ring. Just don't go anywhere. Just stand here. I actually, I don't even wait and sit down by the platform anymore. The minute I introduce the fighters and the bell rings, I just walk over to the commission table and I just wait over there. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's been a, a learning curve. And, and for me, that's, that's the, you know, one of the things that I had to, to get quickly under my grasp was, this new bubble experience of how the decisions were going to be read, how they're going to be handed down to me, you know, making sure I have the, I'm announcing it right. You know, if I'm, if it's a split or, you know, majority, I don't want to screw that up and, you know, say the wrong things. And, you know, again, mistakes are, are going to be made. It's inevitable, but the, 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 the bubble threw us a little curveball at first and it was just getting the real estate really walking from over here, going over here, not getting too comfortable sitting ringside and, you know, keep an eyes on Evan because I want to make sure I'm like, Evan, this one's going to end soon. Come with me. Make sure I got this one right. And so he would, you know, be at my side and I'd be like, hey, do I have this written down right? Can I say this? He's like, yeah, you're good. Go. So I always double check, triple check. It's important. Absolutely, man. Have you ever lost your notes? Uh, no. Knock on wood. Knock on wood. Uh, it would just be in your tux pocket somewhere. Or yeah, even right, in, right in that jacket pocket, man. I got those top rank cards and uh, usually I have a cheat sheet with me too. So, you know, if I see over the, you know, and also too, now I pretty much have an understanding of, of how the fight's going to go. Uh, usually I can, I can tell if it's a, you know, going to be a unanimous decision or, you know, rarely do we get anything that's kind of too wonky, but sure yeah. enough in the first month that I was in that bubble, I think I probably had every type of decision under the sun and it was right. good because again, you're, got to learn right and you lean over to the commission's table and she's like it's a majority draw and I'm like what the hell are you talking about majority draw so I'm like well, how do I how am I going to read these scores to make sure I don't give it away you know things like that and um you know it, it it's been great man I just so again I, I probably said it 10 times in this interview I'm just blessed to to have this opportunity and you know even just being on your show dude it, it, it's just been a it's been a trip and honored to be here Hey, well, you know what? We have the platform, and a lot of times when we, when we bring our guests on here, we don't just talk to them about their boxing, or we don't just talk to them about their MMA. We want people to feel comfortable and pull out a lot of times that other interviewees aren't able to pull out because maybe they're, they got the handcuffs on or, hey, don't ask them that. But we have the freedom here. We've been blessed with the fighter's voice to give the fighter a platform, and you don't need a mouthpiece or boxing gloves to be on the show. 
where you're also a fighter in life. You're, you're a fighter to get that new acting gig. You're a fighter to get that new uh, uh, promotion in work or you're fighting for your marriage or you're fighting cancer. We had all the above uh, on the show. So we are truly blessed to, to say, hey, thank you, Jesus. We have this platform to give back this opportunity. You understand? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been amazing, dude. Thank you so much. And, you know, I, like I said, it's, uh, it's a great sport to be a part of. Uh, an even better sport to be a part of when you can say you're you're part of that top rank family. So big tip of the cap to the guys at top rank for uh, for bringing me into the mix. That's a great collaboration, man, with them and ESPN. I mean, that was a slam dunk. I mean, that they just work great together. And yeah. if you can watch the other fight, other fights, and other events, and, and and cools to them, they do a great job. But there's nothing like the limelight of ESPN and that collaboration with top rank boxing. And the numbers don't lie, you know, I, again, new to, to broadcast sports in, in this in this realm, you know, up to this point, it's been National Hockey League stuff, Vegas Golden Knights stuff. But when you're starting to see reports come by your desk that, you know, a million and a half people tuned in for this or two million tuned in for that. And, you know, it's 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 it's, it's great for the sport. And, uh, you know, when I see the fight that just happened on the zone and you know see garcia you know knocking him out and, and looking at that division now and, and these young fighters that are headlining that division it's just it's great for the sport you know boxing is is on fire right now and to be a part of it in any shape or form anybody working in boxing in any capacity right now you've got to be excited for the future of the sport uh the talent is unbelievable uh and, you know, this the social media stuff that goes on in boxing is unlike anything else. You know, the <laughs> following fighters on, on Twitter is outstanding. Like, that's a sport to itself. And, you know, I didn't realize how, how much they got into it. And uh, it's, it's, it's great. I'm excited for, uh, for this year. I think we're going to see a lot, of, a lot of big fights get made uh, because the fans want it. You know, I think, uh, you know, the, with what Top Rank's doing on ESPN, what the zone has got going on, Golden Boy – it's just so exciting for the sport of boxing. And, you know, I know there's critics out there complaining all the time, but I'm like, man, uh, we got no choice now. There's so much talent that you, you, every week there's just great fights. And uh, if you're a boxing fan, it's going to be a great year. You know what? Uh, you brought up social media. Uh, I'll take this time. I got one more day, man. I'm on timeout. I shared, <laughs> I shared Ryan Garcia's uh, body shot. And Instagram, they put, they they took me off for three days. Wow. Yeah, and I, and I looped it just to make sure I didn't go over, but I got the email that says, hey, you violated this, this. So you're going to be off the fighter's voice on, on Instagram for three days. So uh, after midnight, I should be back up and running. But I was able to tag you on my other account on Thumbs Up for Richie. So just, oh, great. And, and yeah. that flash got hacked. Uh, and what a body shot that was, though, the one that you posted. Gosh. Like, unreal. Yeah. You know, again, tip of the cap to all these guys. Like, I, I you know, I've, I've watched how many fights now sat ringside for, uh, I can't even count, uh, one punch I'd be on the canvas. <laughs> a, 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 just a, a slight miss and I'd be on the floor. Uh, and just seeing that in slow motion and seeing the body, the, just it was just insane. Insane. You know, that was a good fight going in there. And uh, I got to give it to Campbell, man. He came to fight. And I, I thought he would actually take him into deeper waters and then a lot of questions would be answered. But, uh, hey, Ryan's, Ryan's special. I like to see him move his head more and his feet. But at the end of the day, he did what he had to do uh, at this young in, in, in his career. Answer a lot of questions. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think I'm like everybody else. I wanted to see the fight go a little longer as well to see what happened, you know, in the ninth, 10th, 11th round. Uh, but give him credit, man. He got up off the canvas after two. You know, I, I was like, oh, my God, what just happened? Second round, he's on the on the mat. He got back up and, you know, really didn't bother him at all, it seemed. And he probably won. I think I had him win in every round except for two. Um, and then he, he put him down with that body shot. I can't wait to see uh, that division, who fights who next. Because, you know, everybody's calling everybody out now. And let's just hope these promoters can get them done because – who doesn't want to see these guys fight? You know, everybody wants to see them fight. And I get it. It's a business, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm going to hold out and be optimistic that these fights get made because these guys are just unbelievable athletes. Absolutely, man. The only times you can see them get done is uh, you go to a video game and you can match them up that way. But, uh, <laughs> right? I mean, because everybody wants – what's best for their fighters. And I get it. They have an agent, they, they got a promoter, they got a manager. You want to make as, as much as money with the less risk as possible. 
but at the end of the day, you want that legacy. Some people want the, that future where, where they're uh, okay, financially set. So I understand and I, and I get it. But yeah. the fans, they, they just want to see Rock'em Sock'em business in there. Yeah, 100% too. And you want to see them when they're in their prime. You know, like nobody wants to see 35, 40 year olds fighting. Uh, no offense to the 35 and 40 or 35 to 40 year olds out there, but these guys are all young. They're in their prime. And, uh, you know, I, I think Ward or it might have been Tessator that said it and they made a great point. You know, we put so much emphasis on a perfect record in, in today's day and age where yeah. that 35 and 0 or 20 and 0 or 17 and 0, well, um, you know, we put so much pressure on that perfect record that, you know, what's two losses? What's a loss? Who cares? You know, it, it's not, at least I don't think so anymore. You know, like I, it, it, it's all about the quality of the guys you're fighting. And I'd rather see somebody who's, 21 and three knowing that their three losses were against three incredible champs than somebody who's 20 and oh and they haven't fought anybody we've heard of so i think we put a little bit of you know we we, we dangle this carrot about the perfect record a little bit too much mm. uh, but who cares you know i think these fights are going to get made man I, I really do uh there's there's enough money for everybody you know i, I think there's enough money in the sport that everybody can be satisfied and you know, even at the heavyweight division, I can't wait to see who uh, who our boy fights next. Uh, you know, it's just it's been so it's such a wild ride to be a part of uh, Tyson Fury's you know last couple of fights, and maybe you know that big fight gets made now, and it's just gonna be great. You know, I think this is gonna be a great year of fights. Absolutely. You know, let's talk about that rock star. We talked to, uh, about him earlier today. Uh, the guy that won't allow you to go to the restroom because if you do, you're gonna miss the knockout. Berlango, man, Let, let's talk about him and what he's done with his opportunity. And, you know, I think in 2021, you, you're going to see him, hey, go two or three, four rounds to answer some questions and then put him so he can break that top 10. Yeah, he's he's such a big guy. You know, I think that's really what what separates him in that division is he's just a he's a beast. You know, when he stands beside other guys that he's fighting, it's just it, he's just a monster and he calls himself that now like he stood up on the ropes the last and goes i'm a monster uh, i was sitting there going, i think you are you are kind of scary back up bro back up um yeah like anything else like what i was just saying you know he's going to get tougher and tougher opponents as his career progresses but again he's put himself in a position that uh he deserves now that shot at you know some elite fighters the last guy he fought was never stopped. So, you know, I, I don't know where we go. You know, like he's going to – I don't know who wants to fight him. That's another question. Like who, if I had a belt in his division, I'm not so sure I'm signing up to fight that guy anytime soon. Well, you know what? Since you asked that, since you asked, I don't know who wants to fight him, I'm going to go ahead and plug this kid from Stockton, California, Kilo the Kid Madera, who's 160 pounds, is willing to move up to 168 pounds. And when I spoke to him, he said, I, I know – I don't just want to fight him, Richard. I'm going to stop him. Wow. So I, I will give the plug there because since you did I, I wrote it down. That's why I looked down. I had to write his name down because now I'm going to look it up. Yeah, Kilo Madera from Stockton, California. Kilo the Kid Madera. So. Well, anybody from Stockton, I think, deserves a <laughs> shot. You know, we got, we, got, we, got, we got a fighter or two from Stockton on our roster. To, you know, so, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, I wrote it down. Kilo the Kid Madera. But I, I'm telling you, man, I've, I've been now ringside of like four or five of Berlanga's fights. I think we've had four in the, in the last little yeah. while. And uh, He's something special. He hits hard. And, you know, one of the things about uh, being in the bubble with no fans is you hear those punches, you know, and uh, the different weight classes as we've had. We've had heavyweights in the bubble, you know, all the way down to 112, you know, 111. And, and those thuds – that he throws out there <laughs> you hear them they echo through the conference center at mgm so he hits hard he hits really hard definitely before his career is all said and done i can see him find that light heavy even as high as a possibly cruiserweight sure. i mean shoulders are, are like bowling balls man yeah yeah i think one of the things that I've, I've you know noticed a lot too is just this ability to stay in your division you know especially with the younger fighters right because uh, you know they're not even men yet half of these guys and you know they're fighting in weight classes that they just outgrow and they just get bigger they put on more muscle they become manly men you know and they get stronger they punch harder 
and they just move on into another division and, and being able to witness that with some of these fighters it's just it's 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 crazy you know they're they're kids and yet uh they carry themselves so well and they're dedicated to their profession and uh, been un- unbelievable to watch some of these young guys just move up and, and just constantly get better and better at what they do just like you know everything we do you know we're always trying to improve and, and get better and uh, it's just been it's been an unreal ride hey mark you mentioned stockton california i, I can't uh, go on without mentioning um at one point, was the youngest ever to be signed by top rank, and that's young Gabriel Flores Jr. from Stockton, mm-hmm. California, who's now residing uh, via Las Vegas, Nevada. Yep. Before we he's, talk uh, about- he's, he's unreal, dude. He was just in the bubble with us this last fight because, he's like you said, he's now in, in Vegas. And, again, talk about a kid who understands what it takes uh, to get it done. Um, he does, you know, and he's here now in Vegas training full time. And uh, he just gets it. And watching, you know, again, just the short time that I've uh, officially been with Top Rank, but even prior to that, you know, watching some of his earlier stuff to see where he is now, it's just Stockton's king, man. Like he, he, he get it. He gets it. He's fighting with purpose. You know, he carries his family on his shoulders, which I respect. Uh, we all, we, like I said earlier, we all love our families. We all love our, our brothers and sisters, aunts, uncles, and he's he's uh he's committed to his family he's got great people around him and i just i just love he was sitting ringside with me uh just the, our last fight of the year and uh just so great great to have him uh as a friend you know we, we text every now and then but having him in vegas is is pretty cool because you get to see him a little bit more often and you can watch his training and great kid and also, let's let's not uh, uh, fail to mention his pops, who's very animated, uh, Gabriel Flores Sr. We, we give out awards at, at, at the very end for interview of the year or uh, a trainer of the year and so forth. And he was definitely, hands down, interview <laughs> of, of the year. Yeah. And and his runner-up was himself. <laughs> was, was it the one we had last March? Or was it the one that we had in June of himself? So either way, uh, nominees are Gabriel Flores Sr. Gabriel Flores Sr. And your winner is... Gabriel Flores Sr. <laughs> That's great. Uh, you know, hey, listen, uh, my dad is my biggest fan, right? So I get it. You know, I've got an 80-year-old father who, who loves, loves me dearly, loves tuning in to every fight, watch every hockey game, never missed a show uh, at the Venetian. He didn't care what I was doing. He was there. Uh, sport of boxing is, is no different, man. Like, it's his son. And his son is a special, special kid and has incredible talent. So I, I, don't, I don't blame him whatsoever. And I, I welcome it. And I want more of it. Uh, you know, we can say the same thing about uh, Lopez's dad, senior. You know, just same thing. He's, he's on the edge of the ring. I'm the greatest trainer ever. I'm like, you know what? You go, you go do you. And uh, they, deserve, they deserve that. You know, they, they put in the long hours. They, they drove their kid to the gym. Uh, you know, it's like the memories I have as a kid, my parents getting up early and getting in the cold weather, putting my hockey bag in the car and driving me to the, the rink at seven in the morning. You know, they put in the hours just like I did. So, uh, you know, I, I, there's something special about the father-son relationship in boxing, I think more so than any other sport. And uh, I, I welcome more of that, I think. And you know who does a great job of that is, is Mark Kriegel. You know, he he does so much uh, behind the scenes reporting and, and storytelling on these guys and their relationships. And uh, if you're not following him, follow him, because that's it's he makes a he makes these stories come to life in ways that most people can't. You know, I, I've watched him do his interviews and, and I and I study him just like back in the day. I used to study Big George Foreman and when to look at the camera, when not, when to look at at at. at as your your guest or when you're interviewing somebody and he's just an absolute professional i mean he he doesn't even need notes i mean he has everything right here here and just i can imagine the way he prepares himself and um you know they're documentaries you know every time you watch one of these these uh, interviews or these stories that they put together on espn they're they're straight up documentary films and uh, he's fantastic at it, and it 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 opens your eyes and your 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 understanding for these guys and the sport in a way that I don't think anybody else is doing right now. You know, you see specials here and there, but nothing nothing to the extent and to the depth that Mark does. You know, it's uh, 
it's pretty special. And for somebody who's now working professionally in the sport and looking to grow and, and keep learning, I don't have to look very far, you know, and mm -hmm. that's, that's a, again, beating a dead horse, but that's a testament to who top rank uh, lets into their camp. And like I said, when I get to, to go to work and listen to guys like Joe Tess and Andre Ward and Timothy Bradley, Christina Poncher, Bernardo Asuna, you know, Lupe Contreras, Mark Kriegel, these guys are all Hall of Fame bound, if you ask me. They're just, they're great at what they do, uh, but they're passionate about it, you know. And like you said, it's not a job, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing. And, uh, you know, I'm just honored to be a part of that little family. And plus, he's fit, just like these fires are. My man, the guy, Ripped. he's, yeah, shredded, man. Shredded. Yeah. He, he is. And you mentioned Christina Potter. I can see her with an announcer saying, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hall of Fame, Miss Christina Potter. She's been on the show a couple times, and she is just a professional. I would never, ever, and I made it a point to say, Christina, you're not good at what you do for being a female. You're just good at what you do because she's so passionate about it. And prior to that, she used to do some stuff with the NFL, and she just has that drive about her, just, just that witty, just just that, you know, that it factor. She puts in the work. Yes. You know, like anybody else. You, you can't fake it. Yeah. You know, you, can, you, you just can't fake it. And she puts right. in the work. And, uh, again, uh, honored to be a part of that small team. I learned from everybody. Everybody on that crew uh, brings something so unique to it. And, uh, you know, I just, like I said, I'm a fly on the wall half the time, just watching in the corner, taking notes on, on everything they do. But Poncher and I have a great relationship. She'll text me. We talk a couple times before each, each fight now when we're in the bubble. She'll, cause she's, she's doing the, the, the call off site. She's in California yeah. at the studio and, you know, we're here in Vegas and we'll, we'll touch base either, you know, prior to the weigh-ins or prior to the fights, just to, you know, simple things like, hey, how do you say this kid's name? What do you do? And there's so much, so many notes and, and things behind the scenes that are circulated. ESPN puts out breakdowns and biographies and, and histories and, and all this stuff. So, again, spoiled, really spoiled to have what I have at my disposal. And, you know, I just roll up my sleeves and go to work. We, we've had her on the show, and then when, when she was off, we shot two back-to-back. -back. We had uh, Evan on the show. And then I'm talking about uh, Jamal Herring. Well, I said Jamal real, real fast. I get a text from her. Uh, she's sitting, she says, Rich, it's Jamal. Make sure it's you Jamal. And I'm looking at it right there. I'm like, okay. So I kept going. So, I, hey, I appreciate the professionalism and just looking out for, for one another, anybody that gets behind the stick, you know? Yeah. You got to respect it. And uh, iron sharpens iron, man. I rub off. I mean, I, I, you guys rub off on me, man. So I'm getting as much as I can. From you guys every time that we talk every time we have a show i continue to learn and, and i continue to, to want to grow towards that our, our goal you know is is just trying to give everybody a platform nationally uh, this is this has been fantastic man I, I can't thank you enough and you know thank you for your support thanks for reaching out it's uh like i said i'm just i'm i'm rolling with it honored to be a part of this boxing community and uh again like i said i'm just i'm learning as i go and taking it all with a grain of salt and you know what you just said is is pretty much uh you know how how we've all been at top rank you know the guys have embraced me and, and just guided me and helped me and uh i'm just uh just grateful well listen man before you're a stunt double for mark Wahlberg, how do we stay in contact with you man how, how do we follow you on instagram and twitter yeah it's it's just my name it's mark chinook uh all my handles are just my name mark with a k chinook is s h U-N-O-C-K, spelled not like it sounds, but I'm not hard to find. And, uh, yeah, definitely stay stay on me. And, I, you know, what's great about the boxing fans is they, they let me know when something slips or something's amiss. I, I see it on social. I'll get, a, I'll get a DM from some haters every now and then, and it's, yeah. it, it's, it's welcomed, man. You, you, you got you to gotta stay on your toes. You got to keep learning. And uh, I'm not uh, by any means – uh, finished yet you know there's I'm still finding my way I'm trying to find who I am in this boxing community and I'm, I'm excited for the next next part of this journey and we'll see what this year brings but I'm, I'm really looking forward to it I'm up for the challenge and just excited to get back in the ring hey man I've been wanting to throw out that Mark Wahlberg since the, the, the <laughs> but kind of see a little bit maybe the beard maybe kind of it's the long hair maybe I don't know I need a haircut I gotta shave but well, I got a few weeks before the next fight so I'm gonna let it go for a little while I'm gonna enjoy it Hey man, well, it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to have you back. Uh, we got to get some of those guys on, on the show as well. Um, 
And hey, man, I appreciate you letting people know, man, that, that we're out here, you know, and uh, sky's the limit in 2021. And uh, we're going to be swinging for the fences just like you, Mark. And, you got it, man. It can't, it can't get any worse than it was last year, knock on wood. Uh, we're going we're gonna to slowly start to, to see things get better, I think. You know, I, I wish everybody, you know, health and happiness this year. That's, that's first and foremost. You want to stay healthy. You want to stay happy. Hug your loved ones. And, you know, everything, everything will work itself out. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. And, again, just thank you so much for allowing me to come on and, and talk. It's just been, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. Hey, well, you got it. And if you're out there, you caught the end of the show, you can catch us. Go to the YouTube channel, The Fighter's Voice, www.youtube.com slash The Fighter's Voice. Every fighter has a voice, and so do you. It's a wrap. Thumbs up for Richie. Okay, fight fans, it's not goodbye, but until next week. Remember, remember, remember. It's always voiceography at its finest. So on behalf of Richard Ortiz, Cole Escovito, the special guests, and all the crew right here at the Kick-Ass Podcast, saying hasta luego, babies. And always, thanks for listening.